Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. For centuries, there's always been this dance between music and technology, with each affecting the other in some kind of way. Almost always, though, there's no fighting progress. Music and everything to do with it ultimately bends to the needs and demands of new technology. For example, when the Catholic Church built big, echoey cathedrals in the Middle Ages, the sacred music in those buildings adapted to this new architecture so that it made use of the natural reverb. Fast forward a bunch of centuries. Thomas Edison's talking machine, first demonstrated in 1877, and Emil Berliner's gramophone, which debuted 10 years later, were the first machines able to capture sound, up to three minutes at a time. But because of that recording limit, the standard length of a popular song became about three minutes. So the music bent to the limitations of the technology. I can give you other examples. Radio changed the way music was consumed, marketed, and sold. Jukeboxes helped spread the word on R&B, country, and rock and roll. They were so popular that a coin shortage in 1937 was blamed on the popularity of jukeboxes. Electricity gave us amplifiers and the electric guitar. The microphone turned singers from people who could belt out tunes at high volumes into crooners who used the mic to create softer, more intimate performances. Synthesizers once reviled by many musicians, because one person can make the sounds of an entire orchestra, threatened the livelihoods of professionals, but they were eventually accepted. Sampling, well, that was thought to be evil and illegal at first, but we worked that out. File sharing of MP3s meant that no one would ever pay for music again, but now hundreds of millions of people are paying for streaming. There's more, but you get what I'm talking about. This music and tech dance continues today. And on episode five of our look at rock in the 2010s, we're going to look at how that particular relationship played out and the effect these interactions had on our music. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and this is the fifth and final installment of our look back on what happened with rock and alt rock in the 2010s. So far, we've looked at the death of the 12-year pop and rock cycle, the role of indie performers, the new genres that popped up during the decade, along with the music revivals and comebacks that we saw. And now we'll conclude with how technology irrevocably changed things. Let's start by looking at some of the things we're not doing as the result of technology, beginning with music videos. In the 80s and 90s, MTV and Much Music were the only places we could see music videos. That all began to change in the mid-2000s with the debut of YouTube. By 2010, both channels were barely running any music videos, if at all, pivoting instead to becoming lifestyle channels. This, however, has not meant the end of the music video as an art form. In the 2010s, everything moved from waiting around in front of our TVs to see a cool video to calling up whatever video we wanted on demand on our smartphones. Those million-dollar-plus videos that we once saw became more modest in scope. But because everyone had access to high-quality video cameras and very powerful video editing software on laptops or even phones, people could create pro-level productions, especially after the debut of the iPhone 11. By the end of the decade, thousands of people were making music videos in HD and 4K with just their phones. That included people like Lady Gaga and Selena Gomez and Marcus Mumford, If you didn't have an iPhone, well, any number of Android phones could do just as well. Budgets aren't millions or even thousands of dollars anymore. We're talking about professional-looking stuff shot for peanuts. Missy Elliott released a video for her 2019 song called Throw It Back that cost her $25. Compare that to the 7 million U.S. dollars spent on Michael Jackson's Scream video back in 1995. There were some exceptions in the 2010s. Both Madonna and Britney Spears had videos that topped a million dollars in production costs, and video for Gwen Stefani's 2016 video, Make Me Like You, reportedly had a budget of $4 million. We're never going to see anything like that again. 
Instead, we saw productions like this 2013 video from Hosier, which has had more than a billion views on YouTube. A rough estimate says that that's worth about $5 million in royalties. And the total cost of this video? $1,700. One of the big success stories of the 2010s was the resurrection of vinyl. I remember being told that vinyl was so close to being dead that the Christmas of 1999 might be the last time anyone might be able to buy a turntable because the whole format was inevitably headed for extinction. And it sure seemed that way. People were file trading online, iTunes would soon come online, and people were buying dozens and dozens and dozens of CDs every year. The only people keeping vinyl alive were Luddite purists and turntableist DJs who had yet to make the transition to CD decks and DJ programs like Serato. But then a funny thing happened in 2008. A bunch of independent record store owners in Baltimore got together to try to save their businesses. The solution was to copy Comic Book Day, a tradition created by comic book stores to drive traffic by offering free comic books and special editions one day a year. If Comic Book Day worked, why not something similar for vinyl? We could uh, call it Record Store Day. And so it came to pass. Labels and artists were contacted and agreed to participate. And every year since, the sales of vinyl has gone up in territories around the world by double digits every year. By the end of the 2010s, millions of people were into collecting vinyl, even though almost 50% of these collectors didn't own a turntable. This has accelerated in the 2020s. In some countries, the revenue brought in by the sales of vinyl has eclipsed the money generated by the sales of CDs, and we haven't seen that since the late 1980s. The Beatles' Abbey Road was the biggest vinyl seller of the 2010s, followed by Dark Side of the Moon from Pink Floyd and the very retro Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack. And the vinyl version of this record made the top 10 of the decade. It's Lana Del Rey's Born to Die in 2012. As vinyl sales went up, sales of compact discs went down. Starting in 2001, the number of CDs purchased has fallen every single year. If we look at just the United States, the largest music market in the world, 942.5 million CDs were sold in 2000. So let's call that a billion. By 2019, that number had gone from a billion to less than 50 million, which is a fall of 95% over those 20 years. It wasn't until 2021 when there was a slight, and I mean very slight, year-over-year -year increase in CD sales. And it wasn't just compact discs. As the 2010s began, the recorded music industry was still very bullish on selling digital albums and individual digital tracks. Again, if we look at the United States, 118 million digital albums were sold in both 2011 and 2012. But then things began to drop. And by the time the decade ended, just 39.3 million were sold. That's a crash of 67%. As for digital tracks, 1.3 billion were sold in 2012. By the end of the decade, sales were about a quarter of that. These developments fly in the face of two things we believed with all our hearts back in the aughts. First, that people would always want to possess music, to own music, be it on CD or in digital form. There was that whole long tail theory where songs and albums would live online forever, available for purchase for years and decades. Again, no. However, some artists did do okay with digital sales. The most purchased digital track of the decade was I Got a Feelin' by the Black Eyed Peas, which was bought and downloaded a little over 9 million times. They were followed by Adele's Rolling in the Deep with sales of 8.9 million. And this was in third place with 8.5 million. The third best-selling digital track of the 2010s, Imagine Dragons and Radioactive. We'll get more into why music sales crashed in just a bit. 
I have a theory when it comes to this next tech and music reflection about the 2010s. I can't prove it, but it's something that I've observed anecdotally and I kind of feel in my gut. And it has to do with the end of a dance club scene for fans of alt rock. Beginning sometime in the mid 1980s, it became cool for the cool kids to dance again. The stigma of disco had worn off. And thanks to artists like New Order and Depeche Mode and The Cure experimenting with drum machines, samplers, and 12-inch remixes, an alt-rock dance scene was born. By the early 1990s, there were hundreds of clubs devoting several nights a week, if not all nights of the week, to accommodating people who wanted to dance to everything from Nirvana and Nine Inch Nails to Ministry and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I myself once hosted and DJed at four clubs a week one year in the mid-90s. Then, in the mid-aughts, I oversaw a radio station that hosted five live-to-air dance club broadcasts every single week. These events were part of a larger cultural phenomenon that touched a number of generations of clubgoers. But by 2011, it was pretty much all gone. A few clubs remained, but the scene was nowhere near what it had been. What used to be a rite of passage had disappeared. No more live-to-air broadcasts. It was a catastrophic collapse. So what happened? My theory, and again, this is just a theory. Maybe you can add to this. Maybe you can dispute it. Whatever. My theory is threefold. First, the rise of dating apps. In the olden days, if you wanted to meet someone, you'd have to leave your house, get to a club, stand in line, be abused by the doorman, pay a cover charge, and hope that there was someone inside buying whatever it was that you were selling. Dating apps made all that unnecessary. Did that help kill the club scene? I can't prove it, but I know that it didn't help. Second, gentrification. In many cities, clubs were moved out of their spots because condos and other redevelopment moved in. Relocating a club is expensive, and with margins already tight, many owners just gave up, especially after the financial crisis of 2008. We stopped going out to dance because there were fewer places where we could do it. And finally, music changed. As we've seen in other chapters of this series, much of the alt-rock of the 2010s was less intense and more pop. What made it to the radio was, in general, much less aggressive and beat-heavy and much more mid-tempo. If you were looking for high-energy dance music, you were most likely into EDM, presented by superstar DJs. Other options included hip-hop and rhythmic pop music. But alt-rock for dancing? Not so much. At least not the new stuff. There was much less of this music that lent itself to the creation of 12-inch dance remixes, too. Which is not to say that they didn't exist. They did, of course. But certainly not in the numbers that we saw back in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. A Depeche Mode single could be remixed a dozen different ways just for nightclubs. Same thing with anything by Nine Inch Nails or U2 or even Coldplay. But by the 2010s, any 12-inch singles that were being made were most likely to be co-opted by and popularized by EDM culture. Here's an example. It's a 12 inch dance remix of a 21 Pilots song. Yeah, I, I did say 21 Pilots. Wish we could turn back time to the good old days when the mom was saying us to sleep, but now wish to stay. If 21 Pilots had been around in 1995, that song would have been remixed in a host of different ways, specifically for the alt rock dance club scene. That era seems to have passed, for now anyway. The next change in the 2010s might be related to the demise of alt-rock dance clubs, and it has to do with the rise of streaming. We now have to discuss the impact of streaming on the music of the 2010s, and this is a very big and a very complex topic. Let's start with this. When you sign up to a streaming music service, you exchange possession of music for access to music you now have access to tens and tens and tens of millions of songs, but you do not own these recordings. You only listen to them as long as you maintain your subscription. If you don't, they're gone. All the music disappears. Compare that to buying a CD or a vinyl record. You have that music theoretically forever and can listen to it or not an unlimited number of times. The move from thinking in terms of access and convenience from possession required a major change in attitude. In effect, we moved from buying music to renting it. And while streaming boomed in the 2010s, not everybody bought in. But by 2015, there was absolutely no question as to where the future lay. 
Legal streaming as we know it really begins with a platform called Rhapsody, which debuted on December 3rd, 2001. It was then rebranded as a legal version of Napster when they bought all the assets and rights, and still exists today, serving subscribers in about three dozen countries. A ton of competitors followed, most notably Amazon and the Paris-based Deezer, both debuting in 2007, and then Spotify in 2008. By 2010, rights issues and the fees demanded that the streaming platforms pay were worked out. Tons of companies jumped into the fray. Many did not make it. RDO, GrooveShark, Songza, Radical.fm, Groove Music Pass, Mix Radio Mog, Yahoo Music Unlimited, Mix Radio, SimFi, Slacker, and a couple of dozen more either shut down or merged with other services. This attrition was a bit scary for music fans. I mean, what happened to all your music if your streaming provider went belly up? But at the same time, the idea of being able to access so much music was pretty sexy. And year after year, more people were converted to streaming, at least for part of their music consumption experience. By the end of the decade, there were about 40 active streaming music platforms, or as the industry calls them, DSPs, digital streaming providers. The most popular, Spotify, they have about a third of the market, followed by Apple Music, which came along in mid-2015, and Amazon Music. After that, it's a dogfight for scraps involving Napster, Tidal, Cubas, Deezer, and a few others. I also need to mention YouTube. So many people get their music through this video service, and we're talking about 2 billion users. And why not? I mean, YouTube is free. Meanwhile, YouTube Music, which succeeded the original Google Play Music, is in about fifth place when it comes to users. Now, I want you to note that I'm not following any company from China because that's a world unto its own. A company like Tencent has over half a billion users itself. Same thing with India and the companies that operate there. However, if you want to add things up, by the end of the 2010s, global revenue from streaming was about $22.3 billion. And streaming was by far the most popular way for the world to get its music. Streaming overtook physical formats as the main way people got their music in 2017. By the end of the decade, 80% of all music consumption was done via streaming. At one point, the market cap of Spotify was more than twice the size of the entire recorded music industry put together. Streaming means we no longer have to wait for the radio or for a video channel to play the song that we want. Everything is on demand. Streaming has become such a big deal that Apple decided to stop making iPods one of the most successful consumer electronic devices ever. And when was the last time, if ever, you burned a CD? Well, there's the ongoing debate about how much streaming pays to artists. Some have done extremely well. Drake was the most streamed artist of the decade, followed by Ed Sheeran and Post Malone. But remember what I said when not everyone bought into streaming? Fans of two specific genres were very slow to adopt this new way of listening. There were country music fans, and rock fans. If you look at Spotify's top 100 most streamed songs of the decade, it's almost all pop and hip hop. Well, okay, there's Journey and Don't Stop Believing. We've got Heathens and Stressed Out from 21 Pilots. What else is here? Thunder from Imagine Dragons. And that's it. Four rock songs out of the top 100 most streamed songs of the 2010s on Spotify. And even then, you could say that these tracks kind of stretch the definition of rock. You know what I mean? Compare that to the biggest rock songs on the radio during the decade. At number five, it was Even Flow from Pearl Jam, then Plush by Stone Temple Pilots. At number three, it was Come As You Are from Nirvana. Two was Man in the Box from Alice in Chains. And this was the most played rock song on rock radio in the 2010s. It was released on August 27th, 1991. Interesting. So why did rock underperform so much when it came to streaming in the 2010s? This needs some context. Now, make no mistake, lots of rock songs were being streamed. It's just that people were streaming a lot more pop and hip-hop. The first demo to really embrace streaming were people under the age of 25. And this was the pop and hip-hop generation. That was their music. So it made sense that those songs would be streamed more than any other genre. 
And as I mentioned on the first episode of this series, it's my theory that the tsunami of young people using streaming to get their music is a major reason why the 12-year pop versus rock cycle broke down after decades. They were listening to so much on-demand music that everything got skewed and the cycle collapsed under the weight of so much pop and hip-hop listening. Streaming of rock songs did pick up as the decade progressed, but even then, most of the listening was to older songs. The most streamed rock song of the 21st century is Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody, which was released in 1975. By the end of the 2010s, it had been accessed close to 2 billion times. Now, of course, that Queen biopic helped, but, you know, still. And then there's this song. One of maybe a dozen billion streamed rock songs. And none of those rock songs are from the 2010s. You're gonna be the one. Let's continue with how streaming affected music in the 2010s. And here's a big one. It did its very best to kill the album. We've already talked about how sales of both CDs and digital albums cratered during the 2010s. Listening to albums was largely replaced by listening to individual songs on playlists. Now we'd already embarked on this route back in the aughts when iTunes unpackaged albums and made individual tracks available for purchase. Why spend $9.99 on a full album when you just wanted one or two songs for... 99 cents each. Streaming took this to a new level. All the best individual songs from whatever era and whatever genre on playlists compiled for moments, activities, and moods. What's more is that once you made it through a few playlists, algorithms fed us a continuous stream of similar material, songs that it guessed that we might like. This appealed to our ever-shortening attention span, and it all cost nothing or something very close to it. So, no wonder album sales dropped. This had all kinds of knock-on effects. First, many of us are listening to a greater variety of music than ever before because we are no longer confined by how much music we can buy. There's more emphasis on singles rather than the longer listening experience of an album. Listen, we're reevaluating the need to make an album in the first place. Maybe shorter EPs more often were better than a full album every couple of years. And something that we saw at the end of the decade, shorter songs that lent themselves to listening over and over and over again, even to the point of putting a short song on repeat. That's a trick, right? You want to stream as much as you can? You have a song like Old Town Road by Lil Nas X, which is a minute and 57 seconds. Just as it gets going, it's over. So what do you do? You listen again and again and again. There were still the traditionalists. Take the Foo Fighters, for example. They continue to follow the old-school route of releasing singles and albums and then touring behind those releases. But things certainly have changed. Despite being as big and as famous as they are, their 2011 album, Wasting Light, was the best-selling of the decade. And on a list of the top-selling rock albums of the decade, it clocked in at just number 50. A few more notes about how tech influenced music in the 2010s in just a sec. No discussion of the dance between music and tech in the 2010s is complete without mentioning TikTok. This was the creation of the Chinese company ByteDance. It arrived in the fall of 2016, and under its original name of Douyin, it had 100 million users within a year, and a billion videos were being viewed every day. Then Douyin merged with another company called Music Li in 2018, and that's when things really blew up. Now, we are still, obviously, evaluating the effect TikTok is having on music. In the beginning, TikTok was just a place where people posted goofy dances. But then, as music became part of these videos, some acts born in bedrooms and basements started breaking through because of TikTok videos. By the time we got to 2020, over 70 artists from TikTok had signed major label record deals. Meanwhile, 176 different songs saw more than a billion TikTok streams. Five of them reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100. Meanwhile, older songs periodically pop up and begin trending as the result of some kind of popular video. And remember, each time a song shows up in a video, the artist gets paid. 
Evanescence was one of those artists who found a little extra money in the mailbox as the result of TikTok. This is one of the songs that paid out pretty well. Not bad for a track that was released in 2003. I have a few more ways about how tech changed music in the 2010s. No longer was it necessary for artists to gather in the same physical space to make a recording. High-speed internet remote collaborations became a thing even before the pandemic. Exchanging files and even playing live together online just blew up. Concert sound got way better. PA technology improved by leaps and bounds through much of the decade. What we hear today at a live event, indoors or outdoors, is way, way better than something that we would have listened to back in 2003. The recording software used to make music got much, much better, much, much more powerful, and much, much more accessible, which is to say it got cheaper. Oh, sure, you could splash out for something like a fully loaded Pro Tools rig, but you could also make some pretty decent pro-sounding stuff with the garage band that came with your Mac. That's how much personal computer power increased. Music piracy wasn't exactly wiped out, but it sure became less of a problem because of streaming. I mean, why bother with torrents and seeding and cataloging and dealing with bad metadata when you could just stream complete and proper songs from Spotify for next to nothing? We started to get into high-resolution music, at least just a little, as people started to discover that there was something that delivered much better audio than crappy MP3s. It was early days, but it was certainly a beginning. And when it comes to listening to music, we do most of it from our phones. Before 2010, people still tended to use a separate portable device like an iPod, usually because they were still using a flip phone. But in the 2010s, smartphones achieved critical mass. There are computers, our communicators, our gaming units, our cameras, and are linked to tens of millions of songs in the cloud. And if we're not listening to music on our phones, well, there's a good chance that we're listening to music on our smart speakers. I'll leave you with this. According to Billboard and all the metrics they use, this was the absolute number one song of the 2010s. It's from 2017, and it's Imagine Dragons. Again. And that's it for the fifth and final chapter of our look back on the rock of the 2010s. This is really just a first draft, though, because as time goes by, the past will come more into focus as we begin to see the long-term effects of what happened in that decade. Here are a few other things that we saw with music in the 2010s. The rise of K-pop into a global phenomenon. That's going to continue for decades to come. This has been nothing less than the next step in the globalization of music. Look at how songs like Gangnam Style from Psy and Despacito from Luis Fonsi travel around the planet. Oh, speaking of which, Latin music busted out all over. Think of the success of artists like Bad Bunny. Boy bands and girl bands came back. Think One Direction. Think Blackpink. And no one had this on their bingo card for the 2010s. Country music crossbreeding with hip-hop. That's just one example of how genres have blurred and something that we're going to have to watch as we move forward. Will any of these things lead somewhere new and exciting? Well, there's still plenty of time in the 2020s to find out. If you missed any of the four previous installments of this history of rock in the 2010s, head over to your favorite podcast platform and download them. In fact, feel free to grab as many ongoing history podcasts as you want. There are literally hundreds of them. We can meet up on X, Facebook, and Instagram. There's my website, a journal of musical things.com. You should also have the free daily newsletter. I mean, why not? It's free. And all emails should go to alan at alancross.ca. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. We'll have to do this again in about 10 years. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.